So, uh, yeah, thank you for coming today. Um, this is going to be our lecture on uh, the theory and methods in human sexuality research, um, which is obviously quite, a, quite an odd topic. Uh, as I said before, my supervisor is actually on a sabbatical at the moment. Um, when you're an academic, every six years, you basically earn a year off where you can do whatever you want and you're free of teaching commitments. So uh, as soon as he reached that six-year band, he was just gone. So I'm on my own, yeah, and that's, that's why I'm giving this lecture For today. A whole year. For a whole year, yeah. You, you get a term every two years, so you can take it a, a term at a time or you can just save it up and, yeah, take a whole year off. I can't blame him at all. I wasn't, I wasn't even bitter because I would have done the same thing. So, <laughs> um, so, but, yeah, I've been, in, I've been in the lab for six years, so I think I'm pretty uh, experienced at this point with, with this kind of research. <laughs> so, um, starting with how we profile participants before they're even in the door. Um, these are things that typically you ask for just as part of every psychology study. You just sort of ask what their age is and their race and gender. Um, and, uh, you know, this, these are all seen as fairly pedestrian. But in, the, in, uh, in sex research, we also tend to ask for their biological sex. So, not what they identify as, but, but their birth sex. Um, and also their sexual orientation. Um, and these things might seem kind of mundane, but actually if you were to include uh, sexual orientation in one of your studies, uh, you might find that the ethics board have something to say about that because it's considered to be quite private information. And you might end up in a situation where people who aren't comfortable revealing it uh, come to the lab and they're reading the information sheet and everything and then they realise they're going to have to reveal this and you've sort of wasted their time and they've had to come in and everything. Um, but in our kind of research, it's sort of expected, and we do have a very, very detailed 20-page information sheet that participants have to read before they come into the lab um, that has all the terms and conditions of all the, all the stuff we do. Um, furthermore, we do have to ask for their sex as well. Um, usually when we say, uh, are you male or female in a psychology study, we just mean, do you identify as male or female? And there's quite a lot of evidence that doing it that way is completely fine. It's not going to interfere with your results or anything like that. Um, but because of the equipment that we use in the lab, we do sometimes have to make considerations based on biological sex and not just based on gender. Um, this never has actually annoyed anyone because if they don't match, then you get paid significantly more to take part in our studies. So generally, people are quite happy with, uh, with the arrangements we've got for them. Um, if you have any questions at any point, by the way, feel free to, to put your hand up. Um, so I guess the next step is how do we conceptualise sexual orientation? Um, and these are the three sort of traditional labels where we put people into three categories of straight or bi or gay. Um, but this is kind of a reductive, uh, a reductive measure for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, firstly is that what exactly classes a person as bisexual? Um, a person who is equally attracted to men and women is going to be very different in terms of their results in the lab compared to like a guy who's been attracted to men maybe three or four times in his entire life. Um, you can't, but then... There are other people who would say this guy isn't straight because he's been attracted to men even once, and it all sort of falls apart. Um, and in terms of statistical analysis, I'm sure you know that there's a problem with just having three categorical va variables, and you're limited to ANOVAs and T-tests and stuff like that, which aren't very good. So uh, in response, we have the Kinsey scale, um, which is something that's still very popular today in research, despite the fact that it was made in the 1940s. Um, and basically what you have here is people who are exclusively straight give you a zero, and people who are exclusively gay give you a six. And uh, in the middle, we have varying degrees of bisexuality. Um, and this obviously has advantages in that people can, uh, they can give you a more accurate uh, account of what their sexuality is. Um, but also, if you want to, you can just say, OK, we're going to do a categorical analysis. We'll call these guys straight, and we'll call these guys bi, and these guys are gay. So you, can, you have the, the benefits of both worlds. But uh, unfortunately, in, in the last few years, at least in my opinion, this approach has started to look a bit dated because we've got these different sort of labels that have started to appear and become very popular. Maybe with the, the exception of asexuality, which is something that's been uh, discussed for a while. But things like pansexuality and uh, this, this kind of label where you separate romantic attraction from sexual attraction are things that have only really arisen in the past sort of 10 years or so. So I think at this point, the Kinsey scale is sort of on its way out on that basis. And uh, perhaps it will be replaced by something which is equally ahead of its time, something from the 1970s, where you still ask people to rate themselves from one to seven. On, so it's on the same kind of scale, and one still means effectively straight, and seven means gay. But instead of asking them just what their sexual attraction is or their sexual orientation, we're asking them about who they're attracted to, um, who they've had sex with, who they fantasise about, and also things like, do they consider themselves to be a member of the LGBT community? Are all of their friends gay, so like social preference? And in addition to that, we're also asking them to label themselves on these, uh, these axes um, according to their past behaviour and their present behaviour and their ideal future. So in this case, if a person is sort of like a closeted, a closeted individual, they might give you different ratings to the ideal future to the past. 
and you end up with a, a better idea of, of uh, what, they, what they really are um, in terms of classifying them for your studies. Um, of course, as you can probably see, if you were, you can be sort of reductive about it and you can just sort of average these all down into a one to seven, that's fine. So yeah, in the end, if you want to, you could just roll all of these into an average and then it's the same as a Kinsey score anyway. And if you want to, you could ignore past behavior, which I think is a good idea. You go with like present and future or yeah. So I think over time, this will probably replace uh, the Kinsey scale. And I think that it will uh, help with um, people who don't necessarily identify just as straight or gay or bi. Now, when it comes to measuring sexual arousal, I guess the first thing to consider is what difference we would actually expect sexual orientation to make. Um, and uh, in, in this case, I, I, it's kind of predictable that we'd expect a gay guy to be aroused by men, and we would expect him not to be aroused by women. And if we have a bisexual guy, we might expect him to be aroused by both, and, and so on. So it's all relatively, all relatively straightforward. But then, how do we actually measure this? And I suppose the most obvious way is to just ask people how attractive they found someone. And, and we do do this in the lab, after we've because we display three videos of men and three of women. And after each video, we ask them how attractive they found the person, how sexually arousing they found it, and, and other questions like that. But now, this does correlate really nicely with sexual orientation. Um, but it's also going to be biased in the same way that all self-report variables are biased. Um, and you can see here the kind of results that we get. These graphs will be coming up quite a lot, so I'm just going to go through what this actually means. This is a Kinsey scale. So this, these, all these people are males, and these are our completely straight guys, and these are our completely gay guys. And uh, this is basically a, a, a different score. So we've taken their arousal to, uh, their arousal to uh, men and deducted from that their arousal to women. So if they're much more aroused by women than men, this is standardized, by the way, so we've Z-scored it. If they're much more aroused by women than men, they end up all the way down here. And if they're much more aroused by men than women, they end up all the way up here. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's exactly what we'd expect it to be. The straight guys are all really clustered here. They're giving really low ratings to all the guys and really high ratings to all the women. And the gay guys are also very clustered up here. And there's some variance across. You know, I'm not sure what, like, there's this guy who's way up here. I don't know. You see that guy? He, that was the single, the single gayest response out of everyone. And, and we emailed him and said, have you given us the wrong Kinsey score? And he just said no. So that's, yeah, that's the score. I, I don't understand. But uh, we, we did check that, that was, if it was a mistake or not, and it wasn't. So I'm not sure, I, not sure I understand. But as you can see, people are mostly, we have very tight confidence intervals. Uh, the regression coefficient is very strong. So the relationship between subjective arousal and sexual orientation is very strong. And uh, if we look at women, it's exactly the same. Um, you see these are our straight women here, and then we've got our lesbians over here. And um, the one key difference between men and women is the, 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 the line is actually a little bit less steep. It's 0.82. But also, you, if you see here, the intercept isn't quite as close. It's not quite as negative. So in other words, when these men are saying, I find these men zero out of seven attractive, women tend to say, actually, I find the women one or two, rather than saying zero to everyone like the men are doing. And that's sort of, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's fine, isn't it? It paints, paints quite a neat picture. But uh, unfortunately, um, it's not quite as simple as, as that uh, because of obviously the biases that are present in self-report variables. So what we tend to do instead is we use physiological uh, measures. Um, and in our case, we use plethysmographs, which are literally just devices that measure the changes in volume uh, within an organ. Um, this is a, a lung plethysmograph, so this guy is sealed in like a chamber where you can tell that there's a certain amount of air in the chamber, and he breathes in and we can tell how much his lungs can carry by uh, the, change in, uh, the change in air pressure. And uh, this is one to see if you have blocked veins where they literally put a tightening, like a blood pressure test, they put a tightening cuff on you and they see how much your muscle grows because that suggests, uh, you know, shows how blocked your veins are. Obviously, these aren't the organs that we're using it for in the lab. Um, we're using it for genital arousal. So in the case of men, uh, we use a penile plethysmograph, uh, which measures the changes in penile circumference. Uh, this is the 1970s model, the first one that was invented that was full of mercury, which is uh, not, not the safest thing in the world. Fortunately, we've now moved on to these much nicer models that won't kill you if they break. Um, this full of indium and gallium, which is just another liquid metal. But literally all this is, is this is a clear rubber, and it's full of liquid metal, and it, a voltage is run through it. And obviously, as, as you get aroused, it sits about halfway down the penis. And as he gets aroused, it becomes stretched. And because the circuit is longer, there's more resistance on it. The electricity has to travel further. And so you, that, that change in voltage is registered as a change in arousal. Um, for women, it's not quite as simple. Um, we have a vaginal photoplethysmograph instead. This is the device uh, with a size comparison for a tampon. It's inserted up to this rubber stopper, which is a, a few inches. 
And what this actually does is it has a red light on it and a photoreceptor, and it, obviously the light is emitted into the vagina, and as, when it's reflected by the vaginal walls, um, it's picked up by the photoreceptor. Um, as women become aroused, they pump blood to their genitals just like men do, but unlike men, it doesn't stay there, it comes back again. So the heart, we basically get like a heartbeat signal, and as more blood is pumped down there, the vaginal walls get darker, and you end up with a more extreme heartbeat signal. So the, the signals are fundamentally different in the way that they look. Um, and I can show you that here. Here's, here's a man, very simple. You can, you can instantly interpret what this man is interested in. You see that he's got literally nothing to, to any of the male stimuli. Um, this is a zoomed in version of, the, of, a, of a female signal. So you can see here, not very extreme uh, uh, amplitude, because um, that's what I'm measuring, vaginal pulse amplitude. And then as the male video starts playing, you can see that they become more extreme. And when we zoom out and look at the entire uh, 40 minutes, this is what we get from this, this signal. Now, the astute among you have probably noticed that uh, she's showing roughly equal arousal to all six. And this isn't because she's bisexual. This is a straight woman, and yet she's showing you know, roughly equal arousal to all of them. And uh, this is reflected in the genital responses. So this isn't subjective anymore. This is the genital one. Again, we've standardized it, and we've deducted one sex from the other. So these are our straight guys. And you can see that we've got a very strong regression coefficient. They're showing a very strong preference for women, apart from this guy. Um, We've got one outlier, and then there's not actually that much variance apart from in the bisexual guys. They're mostly sort of hugging the line. I mean, 0.89 is a very strong regression coefficient in psychology. It's, it's a strong trend. Whereas when you run the same analysis on women, you get that. So in this case, there is a relationship. It's, it's significant, and in fact, at this point, it's 0.001, because I've gathered even more data since I made this graph. Um, but you can see here that with straight women, they're all over the place, and the confidence interval includes zero. So if you run a t-test, what that will tell you is that women aren't actually showing a preference. Straight women aren't showing a preference for either men or women in terms of the stimuli they like uh, in, in terms of their genitals. The people who are exceptions to this are over here, are exclusive lesbians. You can just barely see it, but there is a, there is a trend here. And the trend is that some lesbians, not all of them, show a slight preference for stimuli featuring women over stimuli featuring men. Um, and that effect is driven by the fact that they don't respond to men rather than the fact that they do respond to women, if that makes sense. They, they have a sort of deadened response to, to male stimuli. Um, and I'm just going to compare this now to, here's our subjective measures, our nice trend, and then like, look at this. It's, the men are almost the same. The, the, the trend gets maybe slightly weaker, but they're almost the same. And with women, it's like the trend just completely disappears. So their bodies are doing something that isn't reflected in their subjective arousal, and it isn't reflected in their sexual orientation. And that's led to all kinds of... of because if you think to... The, the male device was invented in the 1970s. The female device wasn't invented until the 1990s. And then about 15 years went by when people were just showing straight porn, like a man and a woman having sex was, was what they would show in their research. And obviously, when women react to everything, it's because regardless of your sexual orientation, if you're watching a man and a woman, there's something for everyone there, isn't there? So you end up with this. And then as soon as they showed men and women separately, they realized that actually women were responding to everything regardless of their sexual orientation. And that, of course, raised questions about, is the device just broken? Is, because it's this weird device that measures light. Does it, is it even measuring the same thing? And it led to research like this, what is sexual orientation and do women have one? Uh, which is a, it's an interesting review. And he's not saying that all women are, uh, uh, are bisexual. or it, It's more of a thought piece. But the question that he's really posing is, what is a sexual orientation? Because it's, is, it, is it just a, a, a tendency to be attracted and report that you're attracted to a certain group? Or does it have to be matched with a physiological response? Does it have to be, you know, do you have to, does your body have to back up what, what your mind is thinking? And uh, unfortunately, this finding has been really widely misinterpreted by the media. They always report this as, scientists say all women are bisexual. This is a Daily Mash article. This was literally about my supervisor. All women are bisexual, claim scientists hoping for threesome. Uh, especially his long-term girlfriend and her best friend, Mandy. Um, this was released just after he released a study about this specific topic, so it's almost certainly directed at him. It was like within weeks of him publishing it. Yeah. And it was covered in the Daily Mail, who ironically understood the findings a lot better than, than any other <laughs> newspaper. I, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. We're not saying all women are bisexual. What we are saying is it's quite clear from any kind of study that you do on sexuality that women's uh, physiological responses don't match up with what's going on in their heads, and no one really knows why. Um, but on top of that, we have another problem, and that's that our studies are sort of subject to volunteer bias. 
Um, we've extensively looked at this, and what we find is that people who are willing to come into the lab and watch porn um, are uh, much more sexually curious than other people. Uh, they tend to have had more sexual partners, they're less conservative, they're less religious, all the, all the stuff that you might expect. And so the question we have is, are we studying this, are we finding this weird thing because the people we're studying are this odd subsample of people? And uh, the answer is maybe, we're, we're, we're not sure. But fortunately, we do have methods of addressing this. Uh, this is our booth in the lab that I'll be showing you uh, when, we're, when we're done here. But as you can see here, we've got a comfy chair that they sit in, and they sit you know, in front of this huge TV. And uh, in front of them, we have an eye tracker, which I think there's been a lecture on eye tracking in this module, hasn't there? Yeah. Um, we don't do anything to do with coordinates. We don't really care where they're looking uh, in our current study. We're just interested in how dilated their pupils get. Um, but here is a previous uh, experiment. I'm hoping this video will work. This is a viewing time experiment. So what we've got here is two students that were rated as attractive. Um, and we literally just do, a, uh, just do an experiment where we assess how much time people are spending looking at each student. And what we find is that, once again, it mirrors exactly the genital uh, trend, which is that men just, if they're straight, they just stare at the woman. And if they're gay, they just stare at the man. Whereas women tend to flip between the two constantly and they show no preference. So women, once again, showing no significant difference uh, between uh, men and women, regardless of their sexual orientation. You see here, they, have, they then have to rate how attractive they are and, and such. Uh, we don't do this, we do pupil dilation, um, which reflects uh, activation of the autonomic nervous system. So it's the same part of your nervous system that regulates breathing and your heartbeat and stuff like that. Um, it's extremely responsive, so you, if you get sexually aroused or interested in something or, or whatever else, it, your pupils will dilate within fractions of a second. And uh, fortunately for us, um, it just so happens that uh, pupil dilation to uh, videos or images of the preferred sex happens to be the strongest pupillary response which exists, which is very handy for us. Um, we actually, uh, when we show people stimuli in the lab, uh, we have to have two minutes of a David Attenborough documentary after each of the porn videos to just like calm people down, yeah. Um, so we have that, right? But um, the problem with that is uh, we can't use that as a pupil baseline because if you're interested in something, your pupils will also dilate. So we actually had to include two videos that are more boring in order to use that as a baseline and then the David Attenborough just like calms people down, which is, yeah. But crucially, it provides the exact same measure for both sexes, so that's handy. And uh, these are the results that we find. Um, as you can see you, see, you still see the same trend. It's not as clear as it was, um, mainly that these straight guys, you can see that their confidence interval is way below zero. They're showing a preference, whereas gay guys, it's sort of less clear that they're showing a preference for male stimuli. But once again, with women, the standard beta is like 0 0.01 different. It's exactly the same. And, and once again, we do find that lesbians are showing a very slight preference for stimuli uh, featuring women, and once again it's driven by the fact that they aren't responding to stimuli featuring men. I'm just going to put the genital one on the screen just to show, you know, I think that's pretty good, I think that's pretty, we lose sort of a lot of predictive power with you know, 0 0.89 to 0 0.6, but in terms of the, the female trend it's quite obvious that we're measuring the same thing. But unfortunately showing people porn is still considered quite invasive, you're still going to get people who aren't going to come into the lab even if you're just doing the pupil dilation thing. So another study that we did, which I'm not going to go into too much detail, uh, looked at displaying non-explicit stimuli. So just displaying like H&M ads where people are attractive, but there's nothing obscene about it. And uh, we found that actually you find the exact same thing where men show this preference and women don't. Um, and it was correlated quite nicely with genital arousal. So we're hoping that maybe we could move into uh, doing that in the future, not showing any kind of porn, not doing any kind of genital work. And at that point, you might be able to reach, because there are certain cultures where you literally just cannot do this kind of research. So we know loads about the sexual habits of people who live in Western societies, and we know almost nothing about anything outside of that. Because you can't, you can't just go to any of these places that people go, like Samoa, and just start probing people's genitals. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So uh, we're hoping that this might lead to us being able to study a wider sample. Um, but that's something that's sort of on the back burner for now. And just to sort of finish off on the, the sex difference thing, on, on sexual arousal, um, it's been found at this point using genital arousal, pupil dilation, viewing time, brain imaging studies of like three or four different kinds. You've got fMRI and EEG. It's been found in all of them. Skin galvanization and heart rate and just, and just like everything you can imagine. It's, you find this exact same trend. And so we really are looking at something that's, that's genuine. And you can tell it's a real mess because you end up with stuff like this being published. This is from 2016. Uh, about women's sexual responses, a review and 10 hypotheses. 
And this isn't even an experiment. This is just a paper that just outlines the, all of the competing theories on why this might be, because no one has any idea. There's all of these theories have evidence supporting them, and, and then someone comes along with a paper and just finds a reason to, to doubt what's being said. So you end up with 10 competing hypotheses. My entire PhD thesis was attempting to explain this, and all of my attempts failed. So yeah, this, this is just how it is. We feel like we're banging our heads against the wall at this point. Um, but when you're designing one of these studies, I couldn't really fit this anywhere else, but when you're designing a study like this, you have to pick porn for people to watch, obviously. And it, it creates a bit of a problem, because if you just go and pick them yourself, then you're going to inject your personal bias into uh, the, the stimuli. So the best way to do it is a pilot study. And the way that it was done for our current thing, I don't know where I put that. I may have deleted my, my slide. But basically, um, what we did to, uh, to uh, pick these videos was starting with 200 videos of 100 of men and 100 of women. Uh, 13 unfortunate research assistants had to watch all uh, 200 three-minute videos. So this is like a, that's like a day of testing. And they all picked ones. They picked 10 favorites each. And then in the second stage, any videos that weren't picked as a favorite were eliminated. And once again, they were all rewatched by those same research assistants who now rated it for attractiveness from one to seven. And then once the, be the 12 best men and the 12 best women were picked, at that point, it went to a public study where over 100 people watched all 24 videos. At this point, you've done enough labor and spent enough money that you might as well have done an entire study. Like, this is just to select the stimuli. Um, unfortunately, this does present a bit of a problem, which is that uh, all of the guys look basically the same, and all of the women look basically the same, because that's what's popular. They all have basically the same body type, and, and so on and so on. So uh, it might have been better to uh, split it down into further categories, especially with the, with the gay guys, um, because all the guys in the videos are sort of quite muscular. And I get a lot of gay guys who walk out of the booth and just go, well, I, that's not the kind of guy I go for at all. Like, I have no interest in that kind of guy. I'm, I go for more feminine men, and there were just none. So, yeah. But you never know. You know it, still, it still works. You still get a response out of them. So, um, so I'm just going to talk briefly about some of the related measures that we've looked at. These are basically things that we looked at trying to explain um, why some women show a preference for women uh, in, in terms of the stimuli they watch. So uh, finger length ratio is uh, basically the ratio of the length of your ring finger to the length of your index finger. So you measure your index finger up to this cur to the, the little crease here. And then you divide that by the length of the ring finger. And somehow, I don't know how, but it was discovered in like 1870 that this has a sex difference. So women have much shorter ring fingers than men. And then somehow it was discovered again that this is linked to testosterone exposure in the womb. I, I don't know how, um, but it does seem to reliably, pr you can predict sexual orientation in women and stuff like that with it. So... And another study did uh, butch versus feminine lesbians, and they found that butch lesbians have much longer ring fingers, suggesting that they were exposed to significantly more testosterone. And then among all lesbians, you find that they have longer ring fingers compared to straight women in general, suggesting that they were exposed to, yeah. It doesn't really work in men, probably because men are exposed to tons of testosterone anyway, just during development, and it's not sensitive enough. But uh, it gets even weirder because there's, a, there's another me a measure called uh, autoacoustic emissions, where if you play a little click sound to your ear and you have a very sensitive microphone, you can hear that the ear sort of responds with its own little click. It's like an echo. Somehow it's been discovered that that predicts testosterone exposure in the womb as well. I don't know how. I, I, like it just, it doesn't, I don't know how, but it, that it was discovered. And it somehow predicts sexual orientation, and it all seems to work. And I don't really understand why. So we thought maybe the, the lesbians who are exposed to loads of testosterone in the womb, we've got these really long ring fingers, maybe they're the ones who are showing this genital response. And uh, it turned out, no, actually, that's not the case at all. Um, another, so yeah, it's, it's one of those things where you do like years of research, and it's just non-significant. Well... So uh, the, another one is masculinity, femininity. This is the last, uh, last variable that we're going to look at today. So um, this is a difficult one to define because if you say to people what is masculinity and what is femininity, you're going to get a ton of different responses. Um, but in terms of self-report, uh, you can measure masculinity and femininity in terms of men and women having significant differences between them, in terms of personality traits or the occupations that they do or the hobbies that they have and the way that they dress and so on and so on. Um, but another way that you can do it is just by taking a video of people and just having them uh, say, you know, what we ask them in the lab is, uh, how would you describe the weather in England at this time of year to someone who'd never been here before? Because we're sitting there filming them and they're sat in a corner and as soon as you mention the weather, they become irate a lot of the time and just start talking about, you know, they, they completely forget that they're being filmed in some weird lab um, and you get very passionate responses from them. 
Um, and using these clips, you can have observers rate them for masculinity and femininity, and people can do it quite reliably. Um, and uh, th we've done lots of research into uh, what these uh, judgments are based on. Um, but it's basically physical appearance, um, how they move, uh, the shape of their body, so like if they have wider shoulders or the way that they walk and so on. Um, or if you go really obvious, if you say, what are your hobbies, then the people will judge based on the hobbies, and that's quite reliable as well. So uh, I, I didn't have permission from anyone to use their footage from the lab, so here is me. Um, um, it's sunny, it looks sunny, and it looks nice, and then you go outside, and it's absolutely freezing. That's basically how it is at the moment. That was... That's painful to watch. <laughs> but uh, I was rated, so it was rated on a scale from 1 to 7. I got a 2.5 on this one, so I was rated relatively masculine. Uh, but there was another year when I came in, and instead of sitting like that, I decided to sit with my legs crossed, and I had my, and I, you know, my, my hands were here, and, and I got a very feminine rating instead. So maybe it's not as, maybe you don't get the, the test, retest reliability that you're hoping for. Um, but overall, as a, if you test hundreds of people, you find that it does correlate quite nicely with sexual orientation. So once again, we were asking the question of, is it really butch lesbians who are driving this genital response? And the answer was just no again. So yeah, uh, we're sort of back to where we started, unfortunately, after three years of research. Um, um, but if you do a PhD, that's what you basically have to be prepared that might happen. Yeah, you might just get nothing out of it. So yeah, that's that. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'll uh, take you up to the lab now and I'll show you the uh, equipment that we use in person. Um, and also uh, show you some of the, the interesting sort of data files that we've gathered over the years. We've got a little gallery of them. <laughs>